Vincent Esline and Greg Smollenberger here from Quebec and Vancouver, which is um, an interesting display of support for landscape architecture in this country. I, I am really honored to be in this room with such a cross-section of Canadian talent. I, I work with many of you and I do know how talented you are. And it makes me um, really proud about the country. So, uh, landscape architecture in five minutes. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm gonna narrow it down a little bit. I'm gonna go into my past a little bit. I'm going to actually talk about landscape architecture as an enabler in placemaking. So, you know, it, it could start a very long process. A venture capitalist who was tapped to start Waterfront Toronto, figure out a way to spend several billion dollars, decided in the front end to develop a structural plan that would spend the first couple hundred million building the public realm. And, and he knew that in fact it could be decades before any of these things would really realize their potential and be seen as something that was as the designers had imagined. So he said, let's get started. Robert Fung, a really visionary man. It, it could also be uh, after 50 years of failed attempts by many people to bring together a nation to declare 20% of their island as a national park, as a way to celebrate uh, their nation's celebration of the 50th year of independence. You know, this isn't something which is of the moment. This is something that they as a nation intend to be permanent. This is an enabling a process for an entire nation to celebrate the nature of the working landscape that they have. You could take a jail, actually you could take two jails. In this case, it was the hospital. The hospital was convinced to buy the jail. The hospital was slated for closure. The president, when she got a job, changed her mind and decided to restore the hospital. She bought the jail. She turned it into the public part of the hospital. It then became a place which is um, the center of a health and wellness campus, of a place of social enterprises. Um, it's, it's a lobby to both the very famous and historic um, Riverdale Park um, and the Don Valley. What you're looking at here is the first 15 years of what's intended to be 30 or 40 years of evolutionary process. You could take an asylum, something wrapped completely in stigma, and have a doctor who suggests that maybe there's another way to get mental health in the city, and was convinced, rather than having a long-standing historic asylum, to simply just do mental health in the city, to make it disappear as a place, and to transform not only the place, transforming lives in a place which in fact simply becomes a living, breathing park of a mixed-use city. Mental health care is still, and research is still the predominant role inside this place, um, but it's a very different process. You could go into the 1768 500 lot plan of Charlottetown, a very famous urban form, live in the city, farm in the country, um, take vacant land, extend the 500 um, lot plan, develop a way that they can extend the center of the city and the welcoming nature um, uh, of, of, of their community coming forward, but also at the same time, find a way that you deal with sea rise, with climate change, with stormwater management, all things that are very front and center in their mind because the, sh the, the center portion of Charlottetown does and is subject to extensive sea level rise. You could take a once vibrant fairgrounds and stadium after the stadium had, had been condemned and had to be torn down and had no sports facilities. And you could reposition it again as a very vibrant place. This is an interesting example of a community changing their mind about a place would be Philip Sparberg Smolenberg from um, Vancouver. Greg Smolenberg took this on and really restored a place in Ottawa to, to great pride. It will take them years to complete this, but it's become an interesting source of pride. It's also the most interesting use for a stadium I've ever seen, the world's largest snowman competition. If you're there in the winter and this is on, you've got to go and see it. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. You know, there are a lot of 1950s single-purpose shopping malls around. They're pretty typically one-third building, two-third parking lot. In this particular case, the decision was made to take the site, cut it in half, make half of it amenity, 
The other interesting thing is that the amenity package, which is the park space, community center, and swimming pools, is the first phase. And so rather than a community waiting forever to have what they need to live there successfully, it's there in the beginning. But my favorite of them all actually comes from a big hole. Actually, a big hole where an awful lot of the city of Toronto came from. You know, the residual moment was um, vacant, condemned, expansive, historic. The hole was filled with the excavation to build Scotia Plaza, bringing it up to grade. What was there, what was almost ghostly in its presence in the landscape, but it was actually all in there and intact. What was hiding there was not a place that deserved to be abandoned, but one of the unique, unique and interesting places in Toronto with an equally important role going into the future as it had in the past. This is the Center for Future Cities, built from the hole that built the city. This is the Evergreen Brickworks. It's almost never vacant at this point. Five years in, it will see about 450,000 visitors this year. It generates millions in economics. There are some common threads. First is that plans can't be disposable. They have to stand the test of time. They do that by getting very broad-based buy-in. If people who feel there's enough in there that's worth spending time. Many designers collaborating produce better results. Most of the things I'm showing you have layers of designers in them, both initially in their creation and through the long-term process of making them happen. And the third thing I would leave you with is a very strong belief of mine that public and private sector economies, economies benefit vastly from the third economy of nonprofits. Thank you so much.